welcome everyone to this afternoon's webinar, the Catman UV Sensor Database. Our presenter for this afternoon is Clark Anderson. He has uh, nine years of experience being a test engineer in the automotive field before he came over and began doing application support for HBM. We're pleased to have him tell us today about the Catman UV Sensor Database. Clark, it's all yours. Thank you, Krista. So, welcome to the Catman Easy Sensor Database webinar. Uh, once again, my name is Clark Anderson, and I'm an applications engineer at HBM. So, what's our objective? Well, we have a problem when we are setting up amplifiers for tests that, you know, every sensor that we assign to a channel must be set up manually. Uh, for each and every test. Uh, so if you use similar transducers for, for different tests, you're, you're setting up the same transducers over and over again. So HBM's solution to that is Catman Easy Sensor Database. And what this does is allows automatic amplifier setup uh, using the sensor files. So once you, you create a sensor file, um, then you just reuse it over and over, and the amplifier will automatically be set up. Um, in addition, uh, it'll it include you can include calibration data uh, so that you can uh, stay on top of that. So in today's webinar, uh, we're going to you know show how to use the sensor database. We'll go over how to adjust sensor settings uh, from default settings and also to adjust them based on your calibration data. We'll cover how to create sensors. And then also, uh, if you have colleagues who are using uh, Catman EV and Sensor Database, we'll show you how you can import existing sensors from uh, existing uh, databases and also uh, CAN settings. So where is this sensor database located? So after we start up Catman Easy, um, either in the signal plan or back jobs uh, window, you'll see that there's a sensor database tab, tab. And when you click on this tab, you will be taken to the sensor database window. Uh, the layout is, uh, Three windows basically. There's a, a ribbon window, uh, and then on the left side, we have a, a sensor group a window. Um, and then the right window is where all our sensor settings will be displayed. Um, and these windows can be adjusted, uh, for size depending on your, 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 uh, PC's monitor. So if we look a little closer at the grouping window, the left one, um, the way we arrange our sensors is in groups. So you can see the first one is the HDM transducers. Uh, the next one is strain gauge transducers. Then we have strain gauge bridges, uh, inductive transducers, temperature transducers, we have uh, DC voltage and current. Then we have frequency, LVDT, resistance, counters, a group called My Sensors, which is where you will create your own or edited sensors uh, with pulse width modulation and then IEPE. Um, so, these groups are by default what comes with the sensor database, but it's also possible to create new groups and also subgroups to these, and we'll show you that later. But once again, it's recommended that you create anything, any sensor that you create, you do it in the My Sensors group. So if we uh, expand the HBM Transducers group, uh, once again, there's, there's subgroups, and it's broken into acceleration, 
displacements, uh, we have torque, pressure, weighing, um, absolute pressure, and, and force sensors. And uh, you can see that these are these are going to be all of HBM's transducers that we sell. And so if we expand on the pressures group, and then on P3 MBR, which is a, a line of pressure transducers we sell, you'll see that there's two range sensors there. And we'll, if we select the five bar, you'll see in the right window that the, the sensor P3 MBR five bar will be populated. Um, in the main description field right here, you'll see that the name is P3MBR Five Bar, which is the name of the sensor file on the left. Uh, this is an important field because the name that you give your sensor is, the, is what Catman Easy will use throughout the software. So when you assign sensors or channels to, uh, to graphs and plots, if you use it based on the name, that's the name it's using. But as you can see, with lots and lots of sensors, it would be difficult to search through them all. So in addition, there's a search function in the left window. And uh, here I typed in full bridge. And the result for those search uh, populates immediately. And in this case, you can see there's four sensors that were returned. Um, once again, this search field, it searches that name description field. So if this does not search based on calibration data or, or uh, excitation settings or any of that. It's only on the name slash description. Uh, another example of a search, uh, here I searched for a C2 sensor, and HBM offers weighing transducers and force transducers for C2, and so you can see that it populated here. Um, it also expands the groups if there's a group called C2. But like I said, since that search field only searches for the name description, Sometimes you may want to search on a different parameter of, of a, a sensor. And so in the top ribbon, we have a, a binocular icon, for, which is for finding. And it allows you to sense on sensor description, sensor ID, serial number, a CAN message, or there's a user-specific option. And if you click the user-specific, uh, the search window will come up. And here you can see that you can check box which uh, field you want to search by, and you can uh, actually search by several of them. Um, you, there's even calibration. Like if you want to say if if, if you want to if you're a calibration group and you want to know what sensors in the database are due for cal, you can search by uh, cal dates that have expired, or or and and, and forth. Now, if we go back to that P3 MDR uh, five bar sensor, and we select it again, once again on the, the right window, you know, is our settings. And here under the transducer settings, uh, we'll show and this is a full bridge sensor. Um, you can see the default set excitation is set to five volts, and it's uh, the carrier frequency set to auto. Um, I'll go a little later, I'll go into a little more detail on that carrier frequency part. But if we click the transducer characteristic, um, here's where we have our electrical and physical values for, for our engineering conversion. Um, you'll see that this sensor by default, it has the zero stand physical. And then it's, it's set in units of bar. And you see the nominal range is five bar. And at zero bar, it gives zero millivolts of volt. And it, five bar, it gives two millivolts of volt. Uh, later on with the webinar, we're going to go through on how to change these because these, all the HPM sensors that are in this database 
are in nominal units, um, where if you would purchase this pressure transducer from us and have it calibrated, the actual sensitivity would be closer to, say, 2.012 or, or just slightly off of 2. Right? So all the ones that the ones in here are, are nominal values. Another thing you can, mix, if we expand on the, the calibration section in the middle, you'll see that there's uh, we can put in description files, so we can uh, attach pictures here, so that if, say, you want to have a picture of your sensors in case it's, uh, you know, you have several, and uh, maybe this one is, is unique looking, um, or you can you can actually attach the calibration data sheet. Um, if you have it in PDF form or, or Excel form, actually any file. Uh, there's a location field, so if if your sensors are like located in a uh, an area like in a different test building or in a bin location, you can put that there. And then we also have the calibration data, so you can specify you know the calibration date, and then uh, you can there's check boxes so that you can. You know, say that the sensor needs to be calibrated before it's used, or also you can uh, prevent it from being assigned more than to more than one channel. And next to the calibration data, there's a a duration of validity. And if you click on that drop down box, you'll see you can select 30 days, 90 days, uh, a year, two years. Um, so you can determine your own calibration intervals here and set it, and the software will remind you uh, when these sensors are due for calibration. So let's say, you, so if you want to edit a sensor, if we go back to the, the left window and we select uh, a strain gauge full bridge sensor, you'll see that there's next to these groups they all have a little padlock icon and that indicates that they're not editable editable um, so in order to edit one of these sensors the first thing we would do would be to to select it and then up in the top ribbon uh, click on copy and then you would go down and select my sensors group and then go up in the top ribbon and click paste and you'll see it will put a copy of that strain gauge full bridge sensor. So the first thing we should want to do here is change the name because copy of strain gauge full bridge sensor is not a, a very descriptive name. Uh, in this case, I went into the name description field and changed it to axle load cell. And you can see in the left window that now axle load cell is the name for that sensor. So the, ne the next step is to look at the transducer settings. And here you can see it's set to 5 volts excitation and for this sensor that's acceptable. Uh, but then the carrier frequency is set to auto. Now the auto setting is preferred because what that allows you to do is use this, this sensor on different uh, amplifier units, uh, irregardless of what their uh, ex a bridge excitation capability is. Um, if you click on that drop down icon, you'll see that there's several selections available. Um, there's auto, there's auto AC, there's DC, and then all the different uh, carrier frequencies for AC excitation. If you set this value uh, specific to say uh, DC excitation, and you try to apply this sensor to an amplifier that does not support DC, uh, Catman will warn you and it will try to adjust if possible. Otherwise, it will give you an error saying that, you know, it's not uh, compatible with that amplifier. Uh, and then the last field there is bridge resistance, which you can uh, specify that if you know it um, or just leave it blank. So, one question would be, you know, is why all the bridge excitation options for AC and DC? So quickly, here's a chart, and it shows the amplitude versus frequency of some common interferences. And you can see that 
down near zero, there's thermoelectric voltage uh, interference caused by uh, the electrical connections. And then here in the U.S., we have 60 hertz electrical power. So you can see that that's a large uh, interference signal, but there's also the harmonics of that. Um, and so those those interferences can show up in your uh, your measurement signal. You see on the left here with a DC amplifier, you know, the DC amplifier passes all of that uh, frequency band. But a carrier frequency or AC amplifier, you see, has a very narrow uh, band that passes right around the, the carrier frequency uh, fre the, the, or the AC frequency. And this allows you to have your signals outside of those interferences. Um, so the, quickly, the advantage is, you know, is it's immune to the thermal couple effects at the terminals and has noise immunity to, uh, to most electrical noise. So back to sensors. The first thing you, some people may ask, where, where do we get these characteristic values for all our transducers? And there's several possible uh, places for this information. Um, if you buy a sensor from us, obviously the first one is a data sheet. Um, but there's also inspection reports. Uh, if you have your your sensor calibrated, you know, the calibration certificate will have a data. Um, and the calibration of, of the curve, you know, there can be tabular data and uh, polynomial data also. So... The standard way or the normal way to set up a sensor in the Catman Easy Sensor Database is what we call this concept of nominal or rated sensitivity. So when you purchase a sensor from us, the data sheet will give you a nominal sensitivity. And what that means is that's the electrical output in millivolts per volt um, at the nominal or rated load. So a a one-ton sensor will give you, typically have two millivolts of volt out at that one ton. And then zero is always, zero load is zero output. So in our sensors, you see under the transducer characteristic, for this axle load cell that we, we, create, we created, the default setting once again is the zero span which is for that nominal. So example here, if I had a data sheet for this axle load cell, you can see since it's a, a load cell, we, that we want to set the units in pounds. And then my sensitivity at zero is zero. And then it's uh, nominal, which is it's a two pound load cell. It's going to put out two millivolts of volt. But if, if I wanted this, unit to have a different engineering unit um, and not do a, a like an online a mathematical calculation, what you can do is you can just, uh, you know, convert the physical units so that, say in this case, I want the load cell to read out in grams, and at that point, 907 grams is equivalent to two pounds, and you see the electrical readings would be the same here. Um, and when you're using this zero span setting, there is no need to set the, the range, your measurement range, because the measurement range is set to the plus or minus nominal. So for the gram example here, measurement range would be set to plus or minus 907 grams. Now, if your test requires a larger measurement range, then... Uh, what you would want to do is to use a two-point uh, setting instead of the zero span. So here for this actual low cell, once again, now you can see when the electrical physical, I've selected two points. And by default, the physical units are, are millivolts per volt. And you'll see that the electrical and the point one and point two fields are grayed out. So the first thing we need to do is to set that to a unit um, 
the non-electrical unit, we're going to set that to what our engineering unit will be. But first, uh, we'll go over what is this two-point calibration doing. The two-point calibration is very similar to the zero and span, except that points one and point two uh, do not have to be zero point or the nominal rating. Typically, they are, and it's it's recommended if you do a two-point to do as close to zero and nominal of the low cell as you can. But they can actually be anywhere along your, your slope. So for our actual load cell, once again, we've changed the physical back to pound, and you'll see that our fields are now editable. And next to the electrical fields, there's two measure buttons. Now, these measure buttons will take in a, an electrical reading once we press them and place it there in those fields. Um, and you'll see that there's a measurement options below that. And if we click on that, you have three options here. The default option is for instantaneous value, which means that when you press it, it grabs one read, uh, measurement value and places in that reading. Um, that's it's that's usually normally sufficient, although if you have a noisy uh signal or uh you know, say like your load cell is on top of a uh energized hydraulic cylinder, there's gonna be some slight you know, movement on that cylinder and so your 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 load cell reading will not be uh constant. So in those cases you may want to choose mean or an RMS. And you can specify the period over which that is calculated. Um, and like once again, you typically make you know point one at zero percent load and point two at a hundred percent, but you can actually do those at any two, any points. Um, and you see the big difference here between two point and zero span is that our the measuring range end and start are defined values. Um, and the reason for that is because point one and point two are not do not define the measuring range. Let's say if you have a load cell that you have had got calibrated, and so you have a table of calibration data. This right here is an example of a working standard. And on the left column, you can see is the uh, the force that was applied, and then on the on the right is the electrical output uh, for those values. So if we take those values and we want to enter them into our sensor database, first thing we need to do is under our electrical physical is change it to tabular. And once we do that, you will have a table. Um, once again, you need to define your, you know, your engineering unit, the physical unit. Uh, you need to define the range. And then you can go in the columns and enter uh, your electrical reading and the engineering unit. And once you've entered those in, there's a plot here on the right side for linearity deviation. And as you can see, this data for this load cell, um, it's a very good load cell. It's very linear. Um, and typically, you wouldn't you wouldn't use a table for a load cell that that displays this this kind of linearity. What the table is useful for is um, if you have a sensor that's uh, nonlinear, or if you have a sensor that, like a compression tension load cell, that has slightly different slopes for compression and tension. Uh, this would allow you to account for that, so that way you would get the, the most accurate measurement possible. But there is there's one there's one other method of doing your, your your sensor setup, and that's uh, through a polynomial adjustment. Now, if you if you purchase a DKD calibration through HBM, you will get a polynomial equation for your sensor's output. And you can see here's an example one. And what we would do is under electrical physical, we would select polynomial this time, and the, pre the example of previous phase, there was uh, three coefficients, so we would enter those in. We put in our physical unit, and then uh, once again, you have to specify the range. 
And, and in this case, you also have to specify the electrical range. And this would allow a polynomial adjustment view to be done. So previously, I showed you how to copy a sensor uh, to edit. But if you wanted to create a whole new sensor, um, what you can do is you click on the My Sensors uh, group. And then in the top ribbon, uh, there's a button called a New Sensor. And you click that, and this will open up the little sensor window here. And here in this example, I selected a you know strain gauge three wire three fifty ohm. So once you hit OK, you'll see that it populates that new sensor to the My Sensors group. Um, once again, I would suggest you know you go and change the name first thing, as new sensor is not a very you know not very descriptive. Um, but all, every time you add a sensor, a new sensor, you'll see it comes with default settings. Um, here for the, the three-wire uh, quarter bridge, you'll see it's got a two and a half volts excitation, the gauge factor of two, um, and then the measuring range is uh, set to four thousand. And for most strain gauge applications, you know that four thousand measuring range is sufficient. Um, and a little bit later, we'll go, we'll go how to adjust those uh, specifically because normally you wouldn't want to create a string gauge sensor file for every string gauge you have. Um, the other way to get sensors in your database would be if you have a colleague who has an existing Chapman sensor database, and so you want to import that into yours. And to do that, when you're on the Sensor Database uh, tab, you click the File Disk at, and then you go to Import, and then you click on Sensors. And this will import a, uh, a whole new uh, sensor database in years. The other thing you would typically be importing would be a Vector CAN database. If you have CAN sensors or if you have a, if you're collecting data on a vehicle with the CAN network, if you have a, a vector CAN database, you know, in .dbc file, you can import that into your sensor database uh, by once again clicking the file disk icon, then import, and then vector CAN database. Select your .dbc file, and then uh, it'll import it. And here's an example of a, a vector file that I imported. It's a Zilla KSO2. Um, this is a fairly simple one, and it has just two channels, a humidity and a temperature channel. And if we expand those and select the humidity uh, sensor, we'll see on the right, we'll populate our, our sensor information. And you'll see it's all populated from the DVC file as far as protocol and scaling. Um, if you if you do not have a DVC file, and if you're uh, reverse engineering, say a CAN sensor, you can you can actually create a new CAN sensor and go in and and enter these values manually uh, uh, if you if you have discovered them. So now that we've created sensors and modified sensors and imported sensors, um, our sensor database is ready for, for our testing. So when we have a, if we go back to the signal plan or DAC jobs tab and we're, we're setting up our test, um, for this one, I wanted to find my axle load cell. But You'll see on, on our right side, we've got the sensor groups, but instead of browsing through all those groups and trying to find my sensor, there's a search window just below it. And so here I type in axle load, and you can see in the, the, the results field there, it immediately pops up as my axle load cell. Um, so once I found that, now I want to assign it to an amplifier channel. And so I just drag and drop it and place it on the channel under the sensor function column. And within the, 
usually one second or two seconds. The amplifier channel now is fully configured, and it's ready for a measurement. Um, and so at that point, you know, I could, you know, start the test and collect data on that channel. Uh, I wouldn't have to go through no manual setup. I just drag and drop. Now, there are cases where you're using a sensor that, for whatever reason, its settings are not correct for that test. And for in that case, if you right-click on that sensor once it's assigned and you select sensor adaptation, the sensor adaptation window will open up. And what changes made here are only valid for the, the test, this current project. There is a checkbox at the bottom to update the sensor database. So if you did select that, then it would update the sensor database. Um, and typically for a load cell, if something has changed in its output, you would want to update the sensor database. Um, so usually a sensor adaptation wouldn't be used for an actual load cell. Where it's normally used is for strain gauges. And you can see here I assigned that strain gauge 3 wire 350 ohm to a channel. And you see there in the column there there's gauge factor. And once again it, it's, showing the, it's showing the gauge factor of 2, which was default. But most strain gauges don't have a gauge factor of 2. They have one that's very close. Um, when you purchase your, your strain gauges, you know, the, the packet that it comes with, it'll list the actual strain gauge factor. So if you right click again on that sensor and click uh, sensor adaptation, since it's a strain gauge, this little strain gauge configuration window will pop up. And in the top left, you see there's gauge factor. And so here is where you would actually input the, say, 2.01 gauge factor that came off your strain gauge uh, data sheet. So when you do this, it's only valid for this project. So it's not affecting the, the strain gauge file in the sensor database. And typically this, this is done because strain gauges are usually applied to a uh, test part. And at the end of the test, this strain gauge is, uh, you know, removed or just left on and you never use it again. And you wouldn't want to create a new sensor in the sensor database for every strain gauge you ever used. Um, eventually your sensor database would become full of just a bunch of strain gauges with slightly different gauge factors. Um, another thing to adjust here would be the measuring range. Um, so, like I said, the default setting was 4,000 micrometers a meter, but uh, you may have, maybe you're using, uh, you know, high strain uh, strain gauges and, you know, you need, uh, say, five, six, seven, or 8,000 per measuring range. The other thing here in the middle is temperature compensation. If you have, uh, uh, if you're using a polynomial for temperature compensation, you can uh, enter the coefficients here. Or if you, you're using a, a second strain gauge um, for temperature compensation, you can uh, check the box here. That would be used if, say, you're using a strain gauge that's been compensated for steel, but you're using it on aluminum, or vice versa. Um, when you use a second gauge, you apply that gauge on the same test material, but in a, a uh, non-stressed location, so that the only output from it is, is going to be temperature effects. And then if you click that box, your data your strain gauge data for your active gauge will be adjusted such that there is no temperature uh, effect on it. It's only mechanical strain. And you can see 
when you do that, you'll do, select the input from and select the actual channel that that second gauge is, is assigned to. So what are some of the recommendations? Uh, the number one recommendation is before you do any modifications is to create a backup copy of the of the sensor database. Um, because if it would ever, if for some reason it would get corrupt or damaged, it would be, you know, you could have a lot of work ahead to recreate it. So right off the bat, you know, create a backup maybe on like a network location. The second thing is don't store your database in the installation directory because when you, if you keep your Catman Easy maintenance up and you download the newer versions as they come out, your cat, your sensor database will get written over and any custom sensors that you've put in there would be uh, lost. And the third is, is more just a suggestion of, of good uh, organization is, is don't make modifications in the general entry for, I think, like, uh, for any of the regular ones is, is instead to make a copy of the HPM sensors or the default sensors and put them in your, your My Sensors group with a new name, something more specific for your test. Um, here this window is of the Catman Easy options and you see on the sensors, the, the sensor database file location is here. Um, this is where you could change, so if you had a sensor database located like on a network drive, um, you could use that um, because you don't have to have the sensor database actually on your PC with Catman. Um, Below that, there's a allow editing of HPM standard sensors. That by default is unchecked and uh, that's what I would recommend keeping it at. Um, that way you, it, it forces you to create a copy versus just editing them. So that ends the, the Catman Sensor Database webinar, but uh, there are many more sources for additional information on similar topics. Or, or other topics, uh, training sessions, you know, application notes, and they're all available at www.hbm.com. Um, there's a Catman Easy training course that's scheduled right now for October 16th and 17th in Southfield, Michigan. Um, if you're interested in that, please uh, go on to our training and events uh, section of our website and uh, register. And if you have any specific questions you know, later on, you can email those to support at usa.hbm.com or call our 800 number at 1-800-578-4260. Um, and if, so if you have any questions, uh, now would be the time to type them into the WebEx chat dialog and uh, we can answer those. Thank you. It looks like we've got one question, Clark, about um, sharing a database between multiple Catman installations. Do you have to worry about people both accessing the database at the same time or anything like that? Uh, you know, I I think I'll have to get back to you on that. I don't, it's not something we've I've come across. Um, but it most likely would be an issue if you were trying to edit the same sensor at the same time. But for most people, companies can have, say, a single database that's on the network and they don't really run into issues sharing that. Yeah, I mean, the best thing would be to do would be to have a master copy and then you would have, and someone would be in charge of that, and then each person would work on a separate copy off of that, and then it would be collated at a later date. All right. Does anyone else have any other questions? 
What I will do is uh, email around everyone who attended a copy of the presentation today. We have also been recording it, so that will be posted on our website if you would like to go back and, and listen again or check in on a few things. Um, you'll be able to find that on the webinars page on our website by the end of the week. We appreciate all of you joining us today.